Yep, it says we're live, but we'll give it a second here. <laughs> there we go. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Uh, thanks for checking out the channel and welcome back to the live stream. Uh, we got about 15 people watching here. Maybe it'll pick up, maybe it won't, but more importantly, happy Father's Day. Uh, a couple of things here. There might be a little bit of echo. We're going to have that all resolved. I was supposed to have some new equipment yesterday. It just didn't show up. And with that, too, I hope you could hear me okay. I'm kind of adjusting some levels right here. What do we got going on? What's in store? Um, well, I actually have some kind of like list of things today that I have in mind. And uh, we're just going to kind of go through them here. And more importantly, the main part of the episode today is we're going to talk about firmware. And like, when is a good time to upgrade firmware? And I want you guys to think about this while we go through like all the introduction kind of fluff stuff is, um, do you upgrade your firmware right away? Meaning if the hot top three company comes out with the hottest firmware, do you upgrade it just because it came out? Or do you hold back to hear what others say? Or do you not even upgrade it until you feel like you could use that feature set? And that's kind of what I'm I'm wondering today and pondering myself. Um, so give me one second. Okay, there we go. So what we're going to do here is, uh, I wanted just to take a look here at VHF, um, six meters, two meters has been pretty cool on FT8 lately. Now, I don't know how many people watching actually watch VHF or uh, actually use VHF for like FT8 and stuff like that, but this is the season for it. Uh, meaning it's a uh, late spring, early summer. And there's these magical days where, you know, the air is just right. And all of a sudden you're making contacts all over the place with six meters. So let's take a look here real quick at the um, propagation map from about 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Look at that. Uh, this was about, uh, this is six meters, about uh, 30 minutes ago, excuse me. And I was being heard all over Florida, Toronto. Uh, Massachusetts and Texas as well. So that was kind of cool. Of course, in the Wisconsin and Michigan as well. And that's just with a horizontal dipole in the attic. So uh, six meters is looking good so far this morning, at least for me, I think that's kind of cool. And uh, if we were to maybe make this go to two meter band, let's see here, two meter band, and we'll give it the last three hours because I don't think I was on that too much. But uh, yeah, two meters, I'm not doing too much now. I recently got a five element Yagi and it's horizontal in the attic, of course, <laughs> and it's pointed south by southwest. So uh, this station right here, hopefully you guys can see that okay, in Peoria, I think that's W9FF. Yeah, I made, oh, uh, yeah, I made contact with W9FF earlier, but this is uh, AA9MY. Anyway, my Yagi is probably pointing in that direction exactly. You can see this is NAYO over here. <laughs> Mike and I have like a direct path every day now, you know, uh, but two meters not looking as good as uh, six meters was, was my whole point on that. And if we take a look at the propagation map, now this is uh, APRS.mentallink.org. You can go to Google and type in VHF uh, propagation map. You can see that uh, it's looking good. I'm just not getting any contacts. So, and over here in, in Europe too, it looks like there's quite a bit of a of an opening here as well. But anyway, it's uh, it's looking good as far as the map goes. And these are like APRS beacons and whatnot. So I kind of just wanted to point that out and show that here this morning before we really get started. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Oh, somebody somebody must have done something because my lights are going crazy. So let me uh, jump back over to StreamYard and find out what's going on here. <laughs> Thank you, Rob Abraham, as the new member. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, appreciate it, man. Thank you. I got my Yezu FT991 back. I traded him the 6100 for the 991, which used to be my old radio anyway. So uh, I hope you're enjoying that 6100, and I'm really enjoying the 991, so thanks a lot, man. Uh, operate, that's cool, man. And uh, you know what? That's probably a good time right now to just jump here, and we're going to skip ahead. The next thing I was going to talk about was the All-Star Sherry's. Uh, but I'm going to talk about... Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk about, uh, before we get into the firmware and everything, I'm going to talk about, uh, Thingiverse and I have a new part on Thingiverse. I want to show you, but also I kind of want to give a little bit of a story. Let's not call it a rant, but it might be a rant. And, uh, they're, they're probably watching, you know, there's those people called trolls and they're, they're watching every video we do. Right. And, uh, they get mad when we get donations or we have members like Rob Abraham chose to become a member just now. I didn't beg him for money. Thank you, Rob. Um, 
And the thing is, is uh, even if I decided not to be monetized at all, and I started to make my money by selling parts, those people would then complain that I'm designing parts in Thingiverse and selling them. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, my parts are all online. Today I uploaded a new part. It's a, it's a part for these mocks and antennas that I showed in my last video, and it's available for free on Thingiverse, but I also sell them sometimes in case somebody needs uh, some kind of... Uh, some kind of part and they don't have a 3D printer. Now, so they don't want me to monetize and they don't want me to make parts and sell them and design them. Uh, and so basically everything I do, they'll find something to criticize. And I think it comes down to more them than me. Um, listen, I understand that you don't want ham radio to be any kind of uh, profitable, you know, whatever. But the fact of the matter is companies like uh, Yezu, QRZ.com, uh, uh, HamQS, uh, what's that one? Uh, QRZNow.com. They all monetize, okay? So I don't know what to tell you. You can download these parts for free at thingiverse.com, uh, or if you need them, you can come and ask me for them, and I'll sell you one. I'm getting myself worked up here. Uh, but then also, I wanted to talk about this next, and this is a, a pie hat. Now, I don't know if you guys have been to uh, Amazon lately. Amazon has this sherry pie hat, and uh, there's something weird about this, okay? What's weird about this? Well, the Sherry Pie Hat, N8AR who created it, he actually had to work with uh, the people who made the SA818 chip. Okay. And he had to get this chip specially made so that it could be put in wideband mode. Okay. Now, this comes in from the market, and it's a Chinese clone of N8AR's uh, Sherry Pie Hat. And it's got really good reviews and really good ratings. Um, although I've asked the question about the narrow band, and actually a couple people have as well. And the guy says it's a universal chip and it will do narrow band or wide band. But uh, as I understand, NAR had to get that chip specially made so it would do wide band. So I guess my point is, is I don't know if any of you guys have this from Amazon, this arsenic one. But I'd like to know if it actually does wide band. And if not, you might want to kind of maybe not buy one of these knockoff clones. <laughs> Uh, but if, if nobody has one, maybe I'll buy one and I'll find out for myself. All right, let's jump back into StreamYard here just for a second. And, uh, well, where did my StreamYard go? I need one more monitor, I think. There we go. Hey, uh, so, uh, anyway, yeah, I was getting a little bit worked up there, but the, the fact of the matter is, is um, you could download some files from Thingiverse, I still try to provide things for free, but if somebody needs something and, and there's a convenience factor in it, you know, I'm not... Listen, and that's another thing, affiliate links, right? An affiliate link doesn't cost you any more, and many times, not every time, but many times I will say, hey, you could use my affiliate link here, or you can go here, and maybe it's a different price or cheaper. Like, I, I will let people know. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but there's people out in the amateur radio hobby or whatever you want to call it, who are really offended by it. And uh, it's almost heartbreaking. It's like they don't want to see anybody succeed for whatever internal thing that they have going on. It's like, get over it, man. I'm designing things and I'm having a good time doing it. And you have to come and shit on my parade. You know? Uh, so anyway, troll's going to troll. That's right. So that pie hat, we'll kind of look into that, I think, in the future as well. Uh, and then... You know, other than that, I wanted to mention Bob, K6UDA. How, how many of you guys remember K6UDA? Uh, leave a one in the chat if you do. <laughs> Morton, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Morton, the uh, most... Uh, how did we say it? The most uh, Illinoisan Norwegian that we know. <laughs> Thank you very much for the 20 knock, uh, which would be what? N help me out here. Norwegian. Uh, I don't know. Kron? Norwegian Kron? And uh, awesome. So, yeah, you guys all remember K6UDA. Well, the cool news is the Kroner. Uh, the cool news is, is uh, Bob K6UDA has a new video out. So Bob is back. You know, and a lot of people like Bob in his videos. So I have a link in the description. Uh, I'll show it here real quick.
Sorry about that. Uh, and so Bob uh, basically is back with his videos, and I'll just give you guys a quick uh, sneak peek of his video so you guys can go check it out yourself. But Bob is back. Sorry for the horrible stop on the screenshot there. Uh, Bob is back, and he's telling you how to build a contest-level ham radio shack. Now, if you guys don't remember, Bob has been away for a while because he, uh, he had moved last year, and he's been kind of getting everything in order for what I understand uh, out there where he moved. And uh, he's going to be coming back with videos, and he's trying to make them... Yeah. I can't remember exactly how he said it, but he's going to have a new uh, format. We'll call it that. And I uh, wish Bob the best of luck. So go check him out, guys. Uh, you know, when you're gone from YouTube for a while, and he does have a passion to make videos. When you're gone for YouTube for a while, you come back. Sometimes that algorithm does some weird things. So go give him some love uh, and say, uh, tell him Ham Radio Dude sent him, you know. Say, Ham Radio Dude sent me. Ham Radio Dude sent me. But what are we really here to talk about today, right? Uh, firmware. Firmware, firmware, firmware. What do you guys think? Uh, do you guys wait to upgrade your firmware until you know it's stable? Do you upgrade it right away? Have you ever run into issues? And, you know, why wouldn't you upgrade your firmware? Let's leave it at that here while, while I kind of get ready over here. And we're going to actually upgrade the firmware for the Discovery TX500 today because there is a new firmware version out. And I want to upgrade it as there's a feature that I think will be really useful for me out in the field. They have a Swedish, a Swedish kroner too. Now, didn't, uh, pardon my lack of knowledge here, didn't Sweden go to the, the Euro? thought they were part of the European Union. But, uh, yeah, so uh, Don's Lock says, hey, I upgrade straight away, no issue so far. Uh, Nick Smith actually upgraded the TX500 three days ago, and I think the firmware came out about three days ago. In fact, uh, what do they call him, the Lion Hawaiian Bow? He, uh, Roven Radio. He messaged me and says, I don't know if you knew about this, but there's a new firmware out for the TX500. And I'll be honest, I actually forgot I had that radio. Um, not that I wasn't like, I don't love the radio. It's just I hadn't been doing any kind of QRP or really any kind of HF too much lately. Besides, you know, last week's incident. Uh, updating firmware live is a risky business, says Kurt. Yeah, you're right. Especially, uh, I've never upgraded the firmware on this, but... This is what it came down to. So I had this radio since, uh, gee, I don't know, March or February. It was one of the last ones to come out of HRO, uh, you know, before everything happened in the world. And I haven't upgraded the firmware at all. The radio works fine for me because I like to do just voice, you know. But the main feature is, let me pull it up here on the screen real quick for you. The main feature and the main thing that kind of was appealing to me was, hey, if you look at the... With every time there's a firmware upgrade, usually there's some kind of uh, what what they'll call like a like a change log or a, a list of feature upgrades, right? And uh, we just got to find it. So if we go over here to the Discovery Lab 599's website, we'll actually see that they say, hey, here's the new kind of features that we're upgrading. And this is a, a beta feature, meaning, you know, beta is like, hey, it's still kind of like in development. But we added a CW decoder function. Now, to me, that's kind of interesting because CW decode would kind of bring this to another level for me if I'm out there. And, you know, I'm learning CW still to this day, but eh, every now and then I need a little bit of help. So it'd be nice to have the CW displaying for me. I'm like, well, that's kind of enough for me to upgrade right there. And then they go on to this extended 10 meter band for TX with taking into account the CB range. I don't know exactly what this means, but I suspect if we viewed the full change log, it would tell us in more detail what this means here. And, you know, I really think that the, the CW decode function kind of gave me enough to want to upgrade the firmware. Uh, but if this was just something like maybe I would never use, maybe I'm not a CW guy, or I don't care to ever be a CW guy, maybe it wouldn't appeal to me to upgrade the firmware in this, right? And that's kind of where I'm going today with this is like, yes, I'll be the guy to upgrade firmware all the time to make a video and show you all how to upgrade your firmware. But sometimes it's like, why do I need to upgrade the firmware every time there's a release? Saigu came out with like, what, six billion firmwares in a week? Yeah, yeah, that's an exaggeration, of course. But 
it just became cumbersome to have to like upgrade the firmware every time. And then of course with their radio, every time you upgrade the firmware, you lost your settings because it's a whole new image that you're putting onto the radio. So I'm like, you know, I just don't, I don't need to upgrade the firmware anymore. Like they fixed the one issue that I was having a lot of grief with. And that was that the, um, the automatic, I don't remember what it was offhand. The, uh, not the game control, but the, uh, yeah, it might've been the game control, digital noise reduction, whatever it was. It was, uh, it sounded very odd and very awkward, you know, and they fixed that. And so I upgraded the firmware, they fixed it. It sounded really good. And I didn't see at that point, any reason for me to continue to upgrade. And my next time I was going to really upgrade was going to be when they actually fix the Bluetooth, which, you know, it appears they may never fix the Bluetooth, <laughs> but, uh, so it was at a certain point that I decided I'm not going to upgrade every every time like even just to show you in the videos this is what the the firmware upgrade is it was kind of getting to be cumbersome and it wasn't adding any substantial value to what i do in amateur radio is i guess my point so let's take a look here at the comments real quick and uh they have a linux firmware upgrade or oh you know i didn't even pay attention to it but you're right they do and tc fits man good to see you again thank you for the ten dollar super chat i appreciate you I don't have a Zygu yet, but the new firmware versions every week would be a real pain. And I kind of think that that's a case too, because like, now I don't know. There was this one firmware upgrade where you had to do the upgrade and you had to deplete your battery three times. And then you had to fully charge it three times before like the memory of the battery was good for that firmware version. And then no joke, just as quick as I finally depleted and charged the battery three times, they came out with the new firmware version. It's like, do I have to do this again? Yeah, you know, it's uh, I don't want to deal with that every week or every three days. And I don't want to put my settings back in there every three days. But, uh, you know, again, I think that the 599 has it right here. Now, I think that ICOM IC705 came out with a firmware upgrade about a month ago, and I haven't upgraded to that either because I'm completely content with where my radio is and there's no major flaw with it. There's a couple of tips I think I want to give about upgrading firmware too. And a lot of this firmware is upgraded by uh, SD cards. But for example, with Lab 599, it's upgraded by a USB. And I'm sitting here thinking in my mind that there's a couple things that I wouldn't want to do <laughs> while upgrading the firmware for my USB device, my Lab 599. And I probably... We all know that we all get noise in the shack sometimes and we have toroids that are helping reduce the noise and everything. But, you know, the USB cables that don't have proper shielding may... Some weird things happen if you're using ham radio, like another radio, while upgrading your firmware on another radio. And I wouldn't want to use any of my radios while upgrading the firmware on one radio because I guess there's the potential that if the upgrade fails because RF went into the USB and disconnected the USB, I might have a bricked radio, right? What do you guys think about that? And then uh, Nick says, hey, it depends on the feature set being released. But the 6100 was definitely glitchy. And then Richard says, I don't ever use my X6100 on internal power. I have a uh, 3 by 18650 uh, Rob, that's the packs I was talking about, the 18650 packs. I couldn't remember the battery 18650 for some reason. But uh, a 3 by uh, 18650 pack, I run with it, and it fits in my little X6100 pack the radio is in. And also, I think that there was a gentleman who 3D designed a radio pack that snaps on the back of the 6100 that holds the 18650s. I installed a firmware ad hoc based on what is in the release. A lot of times, it's not worth the hassle. I think I agree with you, John, and I think that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm really interested to have the opportunity to check out the CW to code function with the 599. But also, I think I have to keep in my mind that this is a beta version. So there could be things wrong with it. Um, I'd like to think it's stable enough where it's not going to harm the radio. <laughs> but I guess we never know. Um, and, and I have to take into consideration that it's not going to work perfect, right? So it's a beta, so maybe it, maybe it doesn't decode, uh, you know, unless the, the signal is so strong 
that it's able to get a completely clean signal. And if that's the case, well, it's not going to work. Bummer. At least I tried. And that's all I have to go in thinking about it, I think. I would be extremely cautious while operating. Or I would be extremely cautious operating while updating firmware. I agree. You know, and so I was going to actually maybe do some, like, let's make some contacts later kind of deal. But I think I need to not do that until the, the upgrade is done. Or do it before the upgrade, of course, right? Seems like uh, 2 a.m. and the lights off, sleeping time to do updates. Like Windows and iOS. Okay, so that's another question. Is there any radios, probably Flex, of course. Yeah, probably Flex. That allows you just to leave your computer in and then it updates itself automatically. That would be pretty cool. Um, the Yaesu FTDX10 is by SD card. The Yaesu FT991 is by USB. The Zygu X6100 was by a SD card, micro SD card. And you have to be careful with that one too because there's actually multiple firmwares you upgrade. So you upgrade the base OS again, you know, the whole image. And then in there you update the app, which was the app GUI. And if you don't upgrade one, the app GUI, all of a sudden, you turn your radio on and weird things are happening. And uh, Rob could probably attest to this because after I dropped it off to him, he was like turning on. He's like, why doesn't this feature work? Why doesn't it transmit? And I'm like, it's weird. It transmitted last week. Turns out I only upgraded the base OS and not the, you know, and not the app GUI OS. And that's kind of what I was going to mention as well, too, is uh, all these. Let's take a look at it here in just a second. But all of these... All these radios have a have a manual, except maybe Zygu. Their manual really sucked when it came to upgrading the firmware originally. And uh, it's very important, I think, at that point to read the manual before we upgrade so we know exactly what we need to do. And maybe every time we upgrade, read the manual or find a YouTube video. The FTM Yezu, which is the FTM 400, 300, uh, is micro SD, is what James says. Lab 599 is working on the B500, which clips on the back of the TX500 and uses 18650s. That's much like uh, Michael. What's his name? Y'all remember on Coffee and Ham Radios back in that day? Uh, back in the dude days of Coffee and Ham Radio? Michael Brewer was on the show from uh, Arizona, and he did a really good job with making that back plate for 18650s and the uh, Discovery 599. And uh, I don't think he sells it anymore, but he did a really good job. In fact, I think I think he has an Etsy store, and even if he doesn't have them on there, maybe you could reach out to him and maybe he would do something and hook you up. So let's take a look here real quick, though. Let's take a breather real quick. I, I forgot how to breathe, apparently, while I'm talking. Good thing there's a mute button. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move this over a little bit, and I'm going to go to the screen here. Remember just a second ago, I was talking about, you know, how if you're doing a firmware upgrade, maybe you want to read the instructions first just so you're kind of like in the know of what you're doing. And uh, here. So I found this page on the Lab 599's manual. And uh, very easily accessible on their website, which is nice because as the typical unorganized guy that I am, which I'm trying to get organized, <laughs> I, uh, I probably threw the manual out or I found part of the manual, but not the other part. You know how it goes. And here it is. Download the software and firmware. So they, they go in to talk about like, here, this is exactly what you have to do step to step to get this thing to work. Download the firmware update. Done. Um, and as Richard says, hey, they even have it for Linux, which is really cool. Download the firmware update. Download, download the latest update. Uh, they go on to talking about how you're going to hook the TX500 into a computer and run the TX500 utility, which I assume is the firmware update that I just downloaded. Uh, but we're going to find out here in just a second. And then they go on to talk about, like, in order to do it, you're going to hold this function key and so forth. But on the bottom of the page... There's a couple of, uh, hey, informations. Uh, don't forget to install the USB drivers, which in fairness uh, for today's tutorial, I went ahead and I installed the USB drivers first so I don't have to go through all that. And I'll probably make its own video on how to do this whole thing. But we're going to try to update the firmware on this Lab 599. 
right now, kind of following these directions. And I am a little confused because it says download the latest firmware application. Okay, there's an application and then there's a firmware update. So I only updated or I only downloaded the probably the application. I need to get the update still. So I'll do that here real quick. And uh, there's my Lab 599 and that camera right here too. Sorry for the quality. All right, let me uh, get that firmware real quick here. Uh, no, no problems, James. Uh, thank you for derailing me. I think I was, uh, sometimes I get super hyper-focused on that. It's everything, right? Do I, ha do I have an 18650 build video? I'm not a battery guy. Uh, James, I would uh, love to get Dennis on. Adam Dennis? I'd love to get Adam Dennis on uh, Denko Batteries, and I'd love to just talk to him for a while and see if he would give us some information about building. Um, he might be the guy, and he might have videos on his YouTube page, or uh, I believe he has a website as well. Uh, but I'm the first to tell you I'm not a battery guy. Now, when, when I say I'm not a battery guy, like I'm not good at building, it'll probably explode. <laughs> Uh, in all fairness, it'll probably explode if I put together something. And you could ask some of the people here, I could look at batteries and I can kill them. They just die. But with that, I'm good at testing batteries. And so I bought a bunch of 18650s from random spots like eBay, Amazon, LA Express. Uh, what are those other garbage sites? Alibaba. I bought a bunch of 18650 batteries recently. They're all over the place. And I got that continual load tester. I'm going to test them because, you know, some of them say they're 3,000 milliamp hours, you know, and they're only like really 1,000 a, a milliamp hours. We're going to test them all here in the future, but I don't have any build videos, unfortunately. You guys remember that 18650 battery I pulled out of the flashlight that one time? Maybe you do. Is that waterproof? And I couldn't get it to work because it had its own BMS on there. But I'm going to test that whole flashlight and that 18650 battery too. I'm going to throw that flashlight in the water. Be down the road sometime. Let me uh, grab that firmware though. Gordo actually, uh, Gordo remembers, Pepperidge Farm remembers, Gordo remembers. Uh, <laughs> I got the, okay, so I did actually download the executable for the firmware updater, but I didn't up, or download the new firmware. I got that downloaded already. It was a quick download on the website. And uh, right now I'm just kind of switching some screens over so you guys could actually see the software to, to upgrade the firmware. That'll be just a couple of seconds. Um, while I'm doing that too, again, I like to say happy Father's Day to everybody. And uh, Nick, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I'm, I'm definitely giving it my best effort to continue to put uh, thought and organization into my streams while maintaining having a good time. Of course, if anybody ever wants to come on the stream and be like kind of BS guy next to me, please feel free. Just uh, shoot me an email or something. Uh, but thank you again. I appreciate it. So uh, let me go ahead and get that up here. What it is, the update firmware software. So you guys can kind of see what we're doing, right? And uh, hopefully... It was supposed to arrive yesterday, it didn't arrive, but I got this new uh, mixer kind of thing. It, it's a, it's basically like an audio mixer as well as a, uh, I can change scenes in OBS really rapidly, so you guys won't have to see me like, let me change screens and do all this stuff here in the near future, which is cool. I, I'm gonna really enjoy that, I think.
Okay, because it's an executable file, OBS doesn't like to actually look at it. So here's what I, I got to do something different. It'll be fine. Okay. Something happened there. It's weird. Maybe not. Uh, let's let's go to plan B. Right now, this is the uh, lab five nine nine, and the instructions on the website state that uh, the first thing that we're going to do is, yeah, none of my windows open anymore. That's weird. Hmm. We'll get it. We'll get it. You gotta love these. Uh, who, who said it earlier? Live streaming. <laughs> Live streaming and try to upgrade your firmware. Yeah. Flash your mic. I you probably. But my audio is. You're right. My audio is off, Martin. And uh, the cool thing about the new mixer board that I'm gonna have that should have been here yesterday is it's gonna resolve all those issues. It's gonna actually. It's gonna cure world hunger too. Uh, but it is going to resolve all the issues. And basically what it is, is that uh, now I won't be going through StreamYard anymore. I'll be going through OBS directly into YouTube. It'll take care of the delay, no problem. So, uh, hey, guys, that's me, totally. Anyway, let's... Uh... Oh, I sound like I'm underwater. One second. Yeah, you know, um, it's not the new mixer that's going to resolve the issue of the underwater thing as much as it is getting rid of StreamYard. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that, that's for sure. Anyway, I'm just going to go through the instructions here. You guys won't be able to see the instructions because uh, OBS is giving me a little bit of problems. But it tells me about all that firmware. We're going to take a look here. And uh, the whole key, I guess, to do in the firmware is it says, hey, connect the TX500 to a computer, which... Actually, on the TX500, this cat control here goes into a USB, which is plugged directly into my computer. Now, I don't have this plugged into an extension USB cable or a USB hub. This cable is going directly into my computer. And the reason I say to do that is, uh, again, if uh, there's any fail points, you want to try to eliminate as many failure points as you can, being don't use your amateur radios while on there. Don't go through a hub because a hub could fail or something could happen. Uh, I have a USB cable here today that I was trying to use in line with this as well as a couple of cameras, uh, this camera right here, and that extended USB cable kept, um, something's wrong with it, and it caused my video to be really intermittent, more so when I plugged it into a radio, my radio kept going like, detect a new radio, and Windows, you know, didn't, so this cat cable is a USB cable on the other end, and it's plugged directly into my computer. And, uh, yeah, this radio is awesome. You're right. You're right, Richard. And so then it says, okay, now that you have, uh, you know, the TX500 on the computer, you're going to load the TX500 utility, which I'm, unfortunately you can't see on the screen. I'll have a video on this uh, soon. And then it says, uh, use the four pin cat serial connection cable that came with the radio, which we're doing. And, uh, then it goes on to say that while holding the third top function key, turn on the TX500. So I'm going to turn this off here real quick. Ah, it's not off. It's not off. You see that? I, I know. I could, maybe I need to learn how to turn this thing off here. There we go. And uh, it says the, it says the fourth function key on the top. So there's a third top function key, my bad. One, two, three. Okay, so I'm gonna hold that down and then I'm gonna hit the power button and we should see the loader is waiting. And it does say it, you might not be able to see it, but it says the loader is waiting. So now I'm gonna jump over to my computer. I'm just following these instructions, right? Start the update uh, application, select the COM port, uh, read the note below and download the firmware file. 
So uh, I have the COM port available. You can't see it on the computer again, but it's COM port 12 because I've already loaded those drivers, which they mentioned down here. And then uh, it says to learn the, load the firmware file. So on the software that's update firmware, basically I'm going to click open and I'm going to be able to go and find wherever I downloaded that new firmware to, which for me is my desktop. And then I'm going to click the update button. Now, if all goes well, it's going to update. And it does say starting update, progress 10, progress 20. I don't know if you guys can see it on the screen here. I'm sorry, you can't. But it kind of says it right here, the upgrade process. I don't even want to move the radio when I'm upgrading firmware. This is a very durable radio. I love the fact that these screw in so you can't accidentally disconnect it or anything. But still, I'm always hesitant to do anything. Todd, thank you for the $10 super chat. Appreciate you. Thanks for some of uh, the most well-rounded radio content on YouTube. I appreciate that. That's uh, probably, um, that's one of the best comments I've seen, you know, and I, and I appreciate that. Uh, I've really worked hard, and I've, I was talking about it the other day. I've been working hard since November to really try to um, actually make the content valuable, okay, and continue to do so. so. So thank you. Now, my computer already says, hey, device update. So that's cool. What does the radio say? It says power off and on now, which I know you guys can't see. It was as easy as that. That's cool. So I just turned it off and then it turned back on. And it showed that the version was one point, I think it said one, one, three. Hey, Nick, go have fun at POTA. It, I'll tell you what, I don't know when you're not going to be on POTA or when you're going to get to POTA, but if it's within the next, say, 20 to 30 minutes, jump back on here. Let us know what frequency. Maybe we'll try to make a contact with you. Thanks for being here. And uh, again, uh, happy Father's Day if you're a father. So that was it. That was as easy as the firmware. Now, you can go through and all day long start to, I guess, what's the word? That's when you kind of get to play with the, does the CW decode actually work? Do the features that I wanted to upgrade work? But the fact is, is, hey, we've actually got past the hard part, and that's upgrading the firmware and hoping we don't mistakenly brick the radio. That simple, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's about it. I'm going to go into a, a whole video about the Discovery 599 and the TX to code and the other features I like about it, which I've talked about for a while now, but, uh, I want to know what you guys think about firmware upgrades. Uh, what's the last radio that you you've upgraded for the firmware? And, uh, here I am, I'm back. I guess I'll do some shout outs now too, because my audio is good, right? I hope my audio is good. Um, yeah, let me know what the last radio that you upgraded the firmware on was, or for was. And um, if you've never upgraded the firmware on a radio, that's okay too. Just, just let me know you've never upgraded the firmware and I'll give you a shout out. I upgraded the KX3 to give you 15 watts. John, I want to know, because uh, I don't know much about the the, the KX3, was that a, a a company actually the company actually released that firmware said 15 watt upgrade? I think that's great actually. That's cool. And uh, Cape Cod the X6100 or the QR2020, very cool. Yeah, the 6100 firmware came out a couple weeks ago. 6100 for the K2EXE. And uh, now K2XE, uh, he's, you're a Linux guy, I believe. I know you do a lot of coding. I traded the 6100 to a guy who I've, Rob, who might still be watching. I really knew that he had and has the, he's the most knowledgeable Linux guy I probably ever met in my life. And uh, I know that he'll do something amazing with a radio if it can be done. So I was like, yeah, it's a no-brainer. I get my 991 back. He gets the opportunity to code. Uh, the 6100 and play with the Linux end of things. And uh, he's already doing some remarkable things with it, but um, maybe we'll see some cool stuff here coming out in the future. I'm not quite sure. 7300, Todd, that's cool. Just uh, updated my lab, 599, right along with you. Joseph, that's cool. It's great radio. I know that the unlucky ham, Mike, who can't be here this morning, I invited him on the show. He couldn't be here. Uh, completely understood. Mike's a busy guy, but he also has a 599, and he wants to upgrade the firmware before... We go do Parks on the Air on Tuesday. If you're in the Illinois area, hit me up. Hey, I'm radio for non-techies. I'm too afraid to update the firmware on my radios. I could understand that. 
one second here. Do you want to come on the show, uh, Ham Radio for Non-Techies? That'd be, we could have a quick discussion or whatever. If you do, I'll get you a link in Discord. I wish this was another time. I got to go to church. Hey, have a great one, Amateur Extra. Appreciate it. Um, and I understand completely. So you do what you got to do and have a, have a great Sunday. If you're a father, happy Father's Day. The RT82, you got the firmware upgraded in that. That's great. Uh, Gordo, how is that radio working for you? I'm interested in playing with the Linux stuff in the 6100, but I haven't taken the leap to uh, ARMB in yet. So it seems like a lot of people are updating the firmware on their radios. Uh, the 991, I will tell you that I think the 705, I know it's backwards, has the potential to have a CW decode. I think it's all in the firmware. And I know the guys over at ICOM don't want to do it. Uh, as Ray Novak said, and I'm not putting the guy down. I want to make that very clear. But as he said, it would just be a bunch of dits and I think he said E's and T's or something along those lines. And, you know, maybe maybe that is the case, but that's also maybe not having faith in your coders. Um, I really think that the ICOM IC705 with the CW decode feature on it would be pretty cool. Not necessarily make or break. Obviously, I own this radio, and it's probably my favorite QRP radio to take out. Uh, but I think it would be nice to have that CW decode feature, especially because this thing does uh, two meters. And I'm starting to get into two-meter CW. I think we're going to get a lo local group of guys here together to do CW practice on two meters on the nights. Hey, guys, listen for Ham Radio for non-techies. He's out, out doing POTA today here in just a few minutes as well. Hey, feel free to come on any time. Uh, let's talk in Discord. Well, I think uh, I spoke really fast today. Anybody here in the chat have anything they want to discuss or suggest for future topics. I'm all ears here for the next couple minutes, or, or we'll call it a short day. And uh, Gordo says, yeah, yeah, the radio's great. I'm just in an area that's crud for amateur radio. But the uh, RT-82 is great. And I guess that would come down to the hotspot. You might be able to get that potential for the hotspot and, uh, you know, like an MMDVM. And uh, I made a few videos on that. And then you could have like basically a home hotspot that will allow you to connect to other DMR hotspots in, in I want to call them rooms, uh, other DMR uh, hotspots, you know, all, all over the place. Uh, talk groups, there we go. Uh, yeah, Morton wants to follow up on 3D printing. Hey, I'm all about that. Um, I know we had, uh, let's do another one. That was fun. We had, uh, Morton and I had a, uh, I spilled my coffee. We had a 3D printing live stream where we designed, uh, what was it, uh, more than a spacer for uh, a DX commander or, you know, a DX commander-like uh, idea. And uh, we had a really good time. I think in an hour we, we kind of just walked through in Tinkercad how you could do that. And, of course, there are better programs to do it with, uh, but Tinkercad's easy and it gets people into radio. Um, so I guess let's, let's kind of roll with this idea real quick. What would be the next step in 3D printing that we talk about, uh, Morton, or anybody out there for that matter? Because I would definitely like to take that to, to another level or to another topic if we could. And Don is the second person today to say something about 18650 batteries. And he says, I've been keen for an 18650 battery or similar show with a battery specialist. Okay. Um, I learned something very interesting yesterday. A lot of you guys might know it, um, but batteries, again, aren't my thing. I learned that there's different classes of batteries, is I think what I was told or explained. You know, and a lot of these LiPo 4 batteries, you see the Miatis and the stuff that come out of certain other countries that uh, are sold for really inexpensive prices on, like Amazon. They, uh, they're like a class B LiPo 4 battery, which means they just don't have the quality as like a class A. And then there's companies like Dakota Lithium and BioNO that use like a class A quality battery is what I, what I kind of understand. So I would definitely be willing to learn more about, and that's LiPo 4. 
Uh, I would be willing to learn more about batteries in general, but 18650s, if we could find a specialist, uh, you know, I know Kevin at Bio, I know, maybe. Um, of course, if y'all know anybody, that's cool too. 3D print antennas for HDs. That's a good one, Gordo. Um, all we would really need to print is, well, I really don't know that there's anything to print for a 3D. You could print like a signal stick does. You could print the base connector part, so it kind of hides the SMA portion where it meets the antenna portion, but that's about all there is to print for that. Todd says battery cases. The Thingiverse link didn't work. Let me fix it. Let's look at that right now. What's going on? Sometimes Thingiverse is kind of weird, too. All right, let's fix this. I'm going to send this link here in the chat. You guys let me know if that works. And you know what? While we're sitting here talking about that Thingiverse link, let me show you what it is a little bit more in detail. I'm just loading up Kira here. We need more two meter FM content from creators to give techs and newcomers cool stuff to try. Hey, John, I'm with you right there. Uh, let's, maybe we're gonna go a couple minutes after the hour and I'm cool with that because let's take a look at this 3D printer thing and then let's kind of go into that two meter thing. And this is something I actually wanted to do today, but I forgot to put it on the schedule. I'm trying. Uh, so this is great. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of two meter FT8 as well as six meter FT8 too, because those are both FT8s that techs can get on. And I think when techs are talking about, like I have tech privileges, I could only talk on the radio on two meters. They don't think about the FT8 that they could do and why right now might be an ideal time. Excuse me. Sorry about that. All right. That link worked. So let's take a look at this here real quick. Uh, yeah, let's do this. Let's do the parts for the beams. And uh, Morton, I know you're a busy guy, and I know that we're on different time zones. So give me a time in a private message, and we'll do a live stream to make it work for you. Uh, but we will. We're going to do just that. And let me show you guys what we're talking about right now. Maybe. Check this out, right? Now, it's no surprise I did a video on how to make a mox in which there will be a part two, just like there'll be a part two to that box I'm building. I don't like to rush things, <laughs> but perhaps this is the coolest thing. Now, I I uh, borrowed the concept from high gain. I bought this high gain antenna at um, Hamvention for, it was brand new, but it was from like the late seventies or early eighties. It was like 50 bucks or 40 bucks. Five element Yagi. Perhaps the coolest thing about it was, was the piece that I found on it, which connects the driven elements to the boom. And it looked just like this. So I designed one. Now this one's one inch by one inch, I think is what it was. That's a little big. I don't know that too many people are going to want to use a one inch outer diameter boom or a driven element, maybe a one inch diameter boom. So I designed this, but then I realized like I could start shrinking it down. So the driven elements could be for three eighths, right? And maybe even this could be for three eighths too, if you're trying to make a really portable one. And I think what Martin is saying is, Hey, he'd like to kind of maybe discuss the concept of building more parts for Yagi's and, um, you know, maybe even Moxins for, for uh, two meter, 70 centimeter, maybe even six meter. Designing more antenna parts. And I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great idea. Like a design and a print, uh, uh, 3D print an ID52 hold holster that would look like a Swatch watch guard from the 80s. I'd have to get an ID52A and also I'd have to do some research on the Swatch watch guard. But we could probably do it. I think I know what you're talking about. Hey, Gordo, take care. Have a great day. But anyway, this is uh, this is kind of what uh, you know, you're know you talking about, Morton, and I'm, I'm totally on board with that. 
Let's talk about uh, let's talk about that though. Let's talk about and let's you're going to hear some noise. Let's do some uh, FT8 on two meters so we can show some of the new guys what FT8 what two meters what their tech privileges could give them. So uh, sorry for the noise. Okay, now you guys should be able to hear me, right? Yes, uh, my voice is out of sync. Uh, tomorrow, the new mixer comes, and I won't have to use StreamYard anymore. What happens is uh, I go through USB for the camera, and uh, the microphone goes through USB, but also the camera goes through OBS, so it creates a delay, right? And I can't fix that because they both go to StreamYard independently. But what's gonna happen is tomorrow, the new mixer will arrive and then I can go straight from the new mixer where everything will go into and go out to uh, OBS directly. And it should make the quality of the live streams better. No more of this fidgeting around for things, but also the sync issue should go away. Uh, I bought the Rodecaster Pro 2, which is just released last week. I bought that like, a month ago and I've been waiting patiently for it to arrive and it was just released so that's cool so let's see now um, my audio's back and I'm gonna try I'm gonna try again to 
connect with WSJTX and see if I don't lose my audio. We're good. My audio might do that water thing again. Uh, if it does, I'm sorry. Here we are in WSJTX. And as you can see right now, six meters is a tech band, right? Oh yeah, I got a plan. Sometimes it doesn't work out as I plan, but it, it's a plan nonetheless. I, I mean, here I am on six meters and I'm starting to see stations rolling in K5 stations, right? W9RN, which he's an EM52, so he must just be right down the road. Um, these are all stations that as a tech I could I can contact. And then if I were to jump over to two meters as well, we're going to make some contacts here in a second. I promise you that. Let's uh, let's take a look at two meters, though. So as a tech, you think, oh, all I could ever do is just talk on the repeaters and simplex. It's kind of boring. Well, you could actually do FT8, too. And again, like I said, this is the time of year. So let me call CQ on here. I hope it doesn't mess up my audio. Your beam is pointed at 320 degrees right now. My beam is pointed south by southwest. I'm actually pointing right to Peoria. Um, I hope somebody hears me. If you guys right now are watching, let's do some two meters. I'm going to call CQ. Uh, the considerate ham will check the waterfall and make sure he's not interfering with somebody else calling CQ. And uh, hold the TX frequency. I'm going to call CQ. I know it says 891 down here, but this is a 991. And I know there's a lot of noise here. What? Oh, my ALC is a little bit high. So it's always good to check your ALC too. Uh, I'm going to bring that down a little bit here so my ALC is okay. And then I'm going to check my power level. Basically, if you're running high ALC, what's happening is uh, you're distorting your signal that goes out so it can create some issues and you might not be heard as well, right? My standing wave ratio is okay. Now I am running five element horizontal Yagi in the attic. And on um, power, I have, I don't know yet. I didn't get that far before it stopped transmitting. Now we could also jump over to, um, we could also jump over to uh, PSK reporter and we could take a look and see where my two meter signal is getting out and who might, might be hearing me. Um, so let's take a look at that real quick. All right. Uh, this was two meters, and this was uh, approximately two hours ago when I started kind of calling. But as you can see, about a minute ago, I was heard by N8YO. I'm sure, I'm certain, before I even click on it, I'm certain that's, oh, I did already click on it. I'm going to say I'm certain that's N8YO. He hears me constantly since I got this Yagi up. Even though I'm pointed south by southwest, uh, he's got a lot of power in his, uh, when I say power, he's got a lot of oomph in his 13 element Yagi, which is probably at this moment pointed directly at me. So he's hearing me at negative five dB. Uh, I'm pointed this way. So I am being heard uh, by KB9 DAK somewhere around Peoria, Illinois, I think just South Southwest of Peoria, Illinois. And that's directly the direction my beam is pointing. Now I don't have the ability in my attic to have a rotatable, uh, beam. So I just chose however it was going to work out the best for, for me in my scenario, right? Um, with that, with that, I mean, that's what it is. I, I'm still being heard. I made contact with a station in Alabama. You know, that was kind of cool. I made Alabama on two meters. I made a contact with uh, this guy in Thunder Bay. Uh, I think I was still actually having the antenna down here in the office at the time. Yes, I had a two-meter Yagi next to me in the office pointing... Uh, at that point, it was east, southeast, and off the backside, I got this guy in Thunder Bay, which was really cool. As I understand, that's a rare grid, too, that I got. Uh, but my point is, is like, okay, so I'm using a horizontal, you know, sideband, these these low signal, you know, uh, modes, excuse me. A lot of people will, will, will rock a horizontal. Uh, doesn't mean you can't rock a, a, a vertical antenna and see, you know, see where you can go, especially when the band opens. And if we take a look right now, yeah, the band's kind of open. 
You know, this is uh, this is our APRS station. Now, the the redder you get, uh, the the more of an opening it is, I, I believe, or the bigger of a distance of an opening it is. But look at there's an opening. You know. So remember, as a two meter tech, you have that ability to go onto FT8. It's a good time, right? And uh, you also have the ability to go on to uh, six meters. Let's try six meters here real quick. I'm not making any contacts, by the way, on, on FT8. Two meters. Uh, but we, we're going to try, we're going to try again, six meters. And then we're going to wrap it up here in just a moment because it's about 10 a.m., I appreciate you all spending the time with me, but let's make a contact on FT8. All right, this portion of the band looks pretty open to me. I mean, most of it does, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't go over to uh, six meters. My apologies. Didn't go. There we go. And, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Did I just lose WSJTX? No. There it is. Sorry about that. All right, so I do see this station here calling CQ, but I'm just going to call CQ myself. And right now I'm putting out what looks like 50 watts on FT8 on two, uh, six meters. And uh, my ALC levels are fine. So I'm, I'm pretty good in that sense. You're calling CQ in my direction on six. Dude, yeah, that's cool. And it might actually be worth the shot. We'll see. Scout says, I think that, or personally, I think that a two meter Yagi antenna is the second best investment an aspiring tech should make. The best investment would be to study, <laughs> uh, would be study aids for their general. That's right. And uh, I would agree that uh, a two meter Yagi, depending on what you want to do, right? Some people don't have the interest in that, but I think it, it does open the doors to all the things you can do that you didn't know about because, I mean, when you're horizontal, for example, or you can switch from horizontal to vertical, you start to see or hear all these different things that you didn't know existed. And you're like, well, what's that? What's that noise? Okay, cool. Do a little research. That's FT8. Um, let's take a look on the map on where I'm being heard real quick. We'll go last 15 minutes so we don't have. I mean, I'm being heard in, uh, I guess that would be uh, uh, Wisconsin. Sorry, I couldn't tell at the moment. I'm being heard in Wisconsin. I'm being heard all over Wisconsin. Of course, all over Northern Illinois, being that I'm only so far away from these guys. Uh, and then I also think I was being heard in Florida, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, Alabama, you know, and all I have is a, a, a dipole in my attic. It's a six meter horizontal dipole. So it's not like I have some extensive, listen, if you're a new tech, all you got to do is put up a piece of wire in your attic. And I know that you can't work the world on a wire, but uh, I do. So uh, it's kind of cool. Let's see if I make any contacts, though. Nothing yet, unfortunately. I didn't make any. That's the way it goes. Hey, I'll tell you what, it was definitely worth a try. And we could talk more about the, the cool things that techs could do in the future. In fact, I think I'd love to do that. We have a couple of techs here that are new to the area that I'm, I'll give a shout out. I think Angelo, Angelo's studying for his general, uh, but he's going to go out and try to activate next or this week, you know, try to get some, some activations for parks in the air. And he's a tech. So there's a lot of people locally who I think are helping him out, but it's really nice to know that there are techs starting to, to form in the area too. And maybe I need to talk with them and kind of find out, like, what's your perception of two meters and uh, what is it you didn't know you could do? Uh, Angelo and them, they do a lot of FT8, though, I'm pretty sure. 
James missed uh, general by one answer and didn't realize he could test again in the same session and re haven't retested again since March. I I also did the same kind of thing. I didn't make my general the first time, but I did find out that I could retest. I had to pay them another 20 bucks and I passed it fine. It turns out at that time, I think, it doesn't matter, but I think at that time they had just changed the question pool and I wasn't aware. How about a stream on APRS with a cell phone and a Balfang? We could probably do that. Yeah, that's something I know nothing about. We'll do a little research and we'll, we'll figure it out. Maybe I'll make a video beforehand, get it all set up, see what kind of issues I run into, and then we can actually do something with it. Maybe we'll go you know, on the air with it. I was also thinking a live fox hunt. What do you guys think of that? A live fox hunt. We'll get some people together locally here, and uh, we'll do like this live fox hunt and, and try to find the, uh, you know, the fox beacon or whatever. Russia, what's up? Okay, Ham Radio. Uh, thank you for being here. Guys, I think we're going to call it a day. Um, again, happy Father's Day. Thanks for being here, spending a good hour with me this morning. Uh, I think we got a lot accomplished, and uh, I wish you all the best. So let's, uh, let's do that cool thing on our way out where I'll give you shout-outs, and then uh, we'll say 73. Uh, 73, Phil, thanks a lot for being here. John, K6RXD. James, thanks for coming back. And... Uh, Morton, thank you for being here, buddy. Uh, Roger, nice to see you, buddy. And Scout75, thanks for being here. Sid uh, Vicious, I assume, or Sid, Sid Vic, thanks for being here. Um, OK Ham Radio, thank you for being here. Ryan, thanks for being here. Ooh, Lionel, thank you for being here, and good morning. Uh, Marvin, thanks for being here. Appreciate you, as always. And uh, Covain, hey, guys, go enjoy field day next weekend, too. I'm going to try to stream on Sunday, but I don't know what yet. It's field day. We'll figure something out. Maybe I'll roam from location to location if that's cool. Covain, good to see you. W. Kirby, good to see you. Ham Radio for non-techies, thanks for being here. Andy Caldy, guys, don't forget to go check out Bob K6UDA's new video. And uh, John K6RXD, 73 to you all, and uh, good day. <laughs>